we are going to be discussing what debate uh, digitally looks like. Uh, we will also be discussing um, the preempt to the topic lecture. If you were not here for the summer camp, um, I, the lecture was recorded that I gave on the topic of CJR, and it'll be your homework between now and next week to watch that lecture and to compose some questions that you have about the things that were discussed um, so that we can have a guided kind of conversation about the particulars and specificities of CJR and what being affirmative and negative looks like in that world. There will be an activity with that so that I'll completely bore you with like talking about the topic, but who knows, the conversation could go in a really like deep and interesting place because this is a very deep and interesting topic, right? That affects so many and many people have opinions and thoughts. And even if you don't, you should um, have opinions and thoughts about how this system operates. So that's next week. You now know what your homework is. Go to the Bottle YouTube page and watch the WCCDI topic lecture. And this is an option. I'm not forcing you, but like, I mean, at a certain point in time, if you keep on going to watch the videos at this place, subscribe to the Bottle YouTube page. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. You know what to do. Um, so there's that. But uh, what does debate look like digitally and how can we kind of navigate those spaces. First is Maya has done a really good job of introducing bottle virtually. That's not what I'm talking about. Today I'm talking about verbatim. Today I'm talking about how to organize your arguments on your computer, on your digital devices, so that you are best able to organize your thoughts, your arguments, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing is when I say verbatim, do you know what I'm talking about? We all have verbatim on our computers. So I, we're all perfect. We all know how to use verbatim. We know how to use all the macros in verbatim. We know how to do all that. Yes. We're feeling good about that. If I asked you a question about how to do a shortcut to AC, you would know how to shortcut to AC in verbatim. No, you would not. No, that's fine. We don't have to worry about that. That was just me seeing the level of how far you played with verbatim. As someone who's been with it for 10 years, I've played with it a lot. Um, but that's cool that you all at least have verbatim. This is going to be important because as the varsity of bottle, we will be cutting cards. We will, I will be teaching you how to cut cards and you will be adding to the packet. Right, so whenever you have moments where you're like, ah, oh, I wish that we could make this edit, or ah, oh, I wish that you know this thing could exist. Guess what? A wish can become a reality real quick, real, real quick. And so we are going to cut the cards that you think are needed in the packet, and it'll build and grow that the varsity students will be able to read. Now I don't know if this will trickle down to like well, varsity and JV. I don't know if this will trickle down to novice. We shall see, they're doing the body cams app, but in terms of y'all being the varsity members of this league, I think it's important that you have a leadership um, kind of perspective of this, of uh, being able to grow the packet that all of y'all will be debating on. So that's kind of one thing that's important too, is uh, organization, especially in the context of everything is on your computer now. There is no longer going to be a situation where your computer is where the debate kind of cars are, your piece of paper is on the side, you're in a building and a physical one where you are debating and then you're able to close your computer to listen to the RFD. Everything is here. And so it's important that one, you um, have a workspace where you're able to do debate just like how you would wanna do school but also too, that you understand how kind of tab room and stuff works. I'm assuming that everyone here has a tab room. This is not everyone's first rodeo with how to log on to it, how to see where ballots come out, where to see pairings and all that good stuff, right? I'm not making that assumption or I am making a very good and safe assumption that we all know this. Yeah, or as, we progress, I will walk through that for folks who like, don't, we don't wanna say they don't, cause like, honestly, we can all use a refresher. Um, and the virtual aspect of this is gonna be very interesting because on Tab Room now, uh, it's partnered with a um, 
programming service called Yachtly. Um, and that is going to be what allows for all the Zoom rooms. And so what you should expect to see is that when you're on tab room right next to the room, there will be a Zoom link. There won't be like a master document somewhere that you'll have to go find and figure out where the room is. It'll be on tab room to show you what link you need to click to go into your room. You with me? That should be very, very simple. It makes life a lot easier. And so making sure that you know how to get to tab room, go to find your pairing and click on the link to get to Zoom will be imperative slash just help streamline the process to getting you to start your round. Second is prep. Uh, prep looks a little bit different now, right? In that uh, there is already going to be a Zoom where you are part of um, for the debate. My suggestions would be that with your partner, you have a, a counter screen, not screen, but at least ability to have a dual screen uh, for like a FaceTime or a Google Hangout, or um, if you're able to join a separate Zoom, I don't know what all of your Zoom accounts are or if there's a capacity for you to do, but to find something where you can be face-to-face -face talking with your partner, of course, social distance, but with you know a phone or tablet or just your uh, like another part of your computer screen. This will be important, one, because Y'all can't be together, right? Or the majority of the time you can't be in person with each other. And these strategies are important because it allows for you to still have those conversations with your partner while also engaging in a digital space all on the same screen. Uh, flowing, 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 flowing. That is going to be something that we discuss and talk about too in terms of how to effectively flow. Um, 10 years in this, my flow could be better. It's because flowing is an ongoing, practice and process. And so that'll be something that we work on. Um, this will look like a few things, watching college level debates and flowing them and me looking and asking to see your flows means that your flows cannot be on your computer. I'm going to make a D rule right here, right now. Your flows have to happen on paper with pens. Uh, that's the best way to teach the skill of effective flowing. Once you feel as your nuance and you've got the flowing game unlocked, then maybe we can talk about um, digital flowing, but that's not where we're at right now. Um, and then I think for now, that's kind of where I'll stop with like logistics and virtual debate. We'll move into, let me, desktop, do, 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 do. We've done icebreakers. I know your names. I've told you what the homework is. So watch the lecture bring back questions. Um, are there any questions for me um, that you all have? Um, it could be, we've done the icebreaker in terms of like the questions, but like the icebreaker that I want to ask of you all is what do you want to get out of debate, right? And then it could even be the question that you have for me of what are things that interest you, Jasmine, in debate and kind of how you think of teaching um, certain arguments and things? Uh, I want that to facilitate and ground the conversation that Brooke is going to have with you or BK is going to have with you a little later on with the PowerPoint that's going to go through just what is the, not what is this topic on like the different areas of it, but just we're talking about CJR. So if you don't got an opinion, you're gonna have an opinion today, right? Um, so that's what's to come. This right now is just debate. Just debate focused, not topic focused. So yeah, who wants to answer that question first? What do you wanna get out of debate? What are some things that you wanna grow? And what's happening here? Um, I personally definitely wanna get more competitive with debate and start you know getting deeper into like certain theories instead of just doing random you know negatives or asks this year i heard i think that's a good one definitely who's next talk to me um, i could go next um I think that I, but like what I most want to get out of debate is I want to be a better speaker. And also I want to like educate myself about, I guess, problems in our society. Cause like 
I don't I don't just want to hear one side of the story from the media. Like I want to have an overall view of what's going on and like virtue. Awesome. I agree with Hong. I think, you know, understanding like actually impactful topics is pretty important. And so, you know, really understanding what the information we're given is and being able to construct a strong argument out of that. Awesome. One more, one more, gotta talk, gotta say something. Uh, I wanna, so I stutter a lot, so like in debate, it helps me know more words and stutter less, so like that, and speak faster, and, and learn new topics and things about the topic that I like. Yeah. Word. Awesome. Uh, and are there any questions for me? Any kind of icebreaker, get to know me in debate? questions about me, not, you know, life things that I do outside of debate um, that you have. This is the time where you can ask them because after this, never again. I'm a close How book. often do you eat pho? How often do I eat pho? Well, that's not really related to debate, but because I brought it up in this meeting, mm -hmm. as a debate yeah. meeting, I'll respond. Uh, not that often. It's just because I live like down the street from a really nice Vietnamese spot that I was like, why not? But I also live down the street from a subway. So it's just kind of one of those things of where do I want to walk? It's a left or a right. But then you shouldn't there's be wanting to walk at all. You said what? You shouldn't be wanting to walk at all, not with this weather. I mean, I shouldn't, but I'm also not wanting to cook right now. Like it's just not in me to do. Yeah. Really just don't feel it. You know, like you just, you just, there's just days where like you should do something, but like no and because like the energy is not there it's not there it's not there but the energy is there to go downstairs um to go downstairs to walk a mile because now i kind of want chipotle i'm not gonna lie after all this conversation i have you. a compul like, i have a love for chipotle that goes beyond just like it's good and i worked there for three years so you know i believe in Chipotle. It goes beyond just the food. I believe in its mission statement. I believe in it being the best version of all the different brands that try to do what Chipotle does. I defend that. And I'm here to debate any person who says Chipotle is not good or there's a better version. I'm ready. That's mm -hmm. that time to debate. I'm ready to debate anyone and tell them that they're wrong because it's not my fault that they don't know quality, but we can bring them to, you know, their come to moment. But yes, that's my roundabout answer about pho is really Chipotle, which probably is what's gonna happen. No, it's, it's what's gonna happen, if we're gonna be honest. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? No questions, no comments? Guest lecture people, hmm. That's something that I have been thinking about uh, a little bit more on the SLC side um, than the regular bottle team meeting side. Um, might do something where it's a mixture, who knows? So to incentivize folks who come to SLC to come to bottle meetings as well. Um, so yeah, but no, guest lecturers in general are things that I'm thinking of about people who exist in the collegiate circuit who do a lot of the things uh, in debate that might speak to you more than I do because, you know, there are a lot of different styles, a lot of different expertises in this activity and to be able to listen in to other folks talk um, about those things is very, very um, helpful. Uh, and also it's, easy, it's nice to break up who you always have to hear from. And I get it, like I know I'm a fun person that makes a lot of sense and you just wanna be around all the time. But sometimes we need breaks, you know? Sometimes we need to like, okay, you need some, you, you, I know what you need and it's not me. And I will bring what you need, somebody else. Uh, and BK, um, they're just getting their, uh, she's just getting her lecture together. Um, but yeah, good question. What's another question for me? What's another question? Y'all just know everything about debate and how to feel. No. Um, my question is, uh, 
like going from JV to VAR, what was the thing you most focused on? Going from JV towards? that I, what was the last part? Or like work towards or work whatever. Towards. Um, I think fear, uh, fear and imposter syndrome, um, were the two biggest things. Uh, and here's why I think that a lot of times the reason why folks don't switch from JV to varsity is that they think they're not good enough or they have an idea of what varsity means and looks like. And for some reason they think it's not them, right? They think that I have to be able to master this endless set of things before I can even contemplate the idea of entering into varsity. And that's not true. It's, it's not, it's not true. And a lot of the times, like it actually affects your ability to learn because you're like creating a cap on your capacity or ability to like think through and build arguments. And so it affects not only how you learn, but it affects your confidence into jumping into varsity and kind of holds you from joining it when you should have. Um, so like you waste some time. Imposter syndrome is the other part of just like, oh no, there are these really good and smart people and I want to be those people too. So I'm just going to fake the funk and I'm going to try to mirror what I think is the best debater in the room when I know that's not me. Not that you're not the best debater in the room, but you're trying um, to mirror what you think is a good debater when that could just not be what what your values, goals, how you even debate and how you could be the best in what you do type of debater thing. And it just becomes a mess. So I would say don't, you know, don't do that. Um, as someone who's coached a lot of folks who transitioned from JV to varsity, both in college and in high school, that it's just confidence and support. If you feel like you're putting the work into developing and growing your arguments and you feel like you're comfortable in the current position that you're in it's time to move it's time to you know to go into a new place where you don't feel like you not know everything but that you don't feel like you're challenging yourself above anything else challenge yourself and so hopefully y'all will be challenged here um because we're gonna do some different things this time around uh, with how kind of bottle meetings operate. That's kind of the beauty of you get to work with us for one time in a week, and then you have these different meetings that your schools will kind of host with you as the school year develops. Um, no, you cannot go back to novice. Sorry, not. Um, but we're going to change some things up in that because we control the curriculum instead of us going to your school and they got kind of curriculum and we're just helping you know, move that one. It's coming from a perspective of someone who's been in this activity for a, almost a decade, right? Who's done not only national circuit, but college and even, you know, back when I was a novice in high school style debate. My goal is to help not only you build and debate and get better competitively for the league, um, but potentially to give you the option to want to join SLC and become competitive in the country. Uh, to want to compete against folks across not the, the world because there are students who um, we have like a Taiwanese league um, and they compete on the national circuit and we have Canada's about to join the chat so a lot of different um, countries that are starting to join policy debate one because they're just like us there's not much more to do there's not like a football team there's not soccer there's not gymnastics there's none of that so they're just kind of like well what can we do that gets our competitive heart racing? Debate, sure can. So that's, that's what we're gonna be building our curriculum towards, is to actually teach you debate and not what we think debate is, what we know debate is. Um, so yeah, any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Less large scope, but um, I heard that this class is ending at 6.30. Is that true? No. Okay, good. I thought no. it was a time. So. No, 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 no. I don't know who told you 6.30. Uh, but this one? Yes. Like oh, no. This, oh, practice. I know what they're referring to. I know what they're referring to. They're referring to our Friday meetings. They go from 4.30 to 6.30. 
I'm but that's sure not talking about what I'm pretty sure that they're talking about the uh wednesday meetings but i think it was just like a typo yeah definitely so not. to 6 30 but yeah, yeah no 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 that's okay. SLC. Oh, I just wanted to confirm. Yep, no, we're not holding you for four hours. That's not, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to do that. Like, I already told you what my plans are, getting Chipotle. Um, I'm trying to see, BK, are you around? Slash, want to do the PowerPoint? Um, because we're slowly, once again, introducing y'all back into the pace of debate. So we don't want to kind of just like throw it all on you um, in 10 seconds, we are gonna kind of build into this. So if you feel like things are moving slow, uh, trust me, they're not. Because we don't want to get to a place where you're like, okay, wait a second, I know I said slow, but now you're just doing way too much. Now you're just, you, did, you said pedal to the metal and I don't like this. Yeah, we're not trying to do that. We're not trying to do that at all, but we wanna build your kind of structure and foundation and the first is talking about debate, talking about your interest in debate, and learning kind of how to think about the topic and then what the topic is. Today is how to think about the topic. Next week will be what the topic is via you watching the lecture. I've said this now probably three or four times, so I'll be really hurt if by next week you have not watched the lecture and don't have questions because I will be confused about what language I was speaking that none of y'all spoke to hear me say, watch the lecture. But, you know, I could be speaking a language that y'all don't speak. Um, let me message because I know once um she gets her lecture and if there's extra time, but like if we're not if we're, if we're done before four thirty, think that's perfectly fine just to let y'all go. Um, because we will have days where we go to time and you'll be exhausted. So, let me. Message. All right. Just waiting for her to get here. Uh, she's here. Clearly, her screen's here. Um, there. Hey. Hello, hello. So I was just telling them the PowerPoint slash what your presentation. Um, and then if there's extra time after. We'll just let them go because we'll have days where we hold them for a long time and days we, don't, we just to clarify we do not have any enough time to do that powerpoint <laughs> okay. um but if you wanted to transition that's cool too okay out of time yeah okay give me one second And I'll keep on recording. Um, so I'll still be here, you all. You might not see my face, but like I always think and listen to debate things. So I'm never fully gone. So I'm in here of support of everything BK has to say to you. So listen. You heard that, Melissa? I, I saw you over there getting a little off the rail, getting too dangerous. It's okay though. All right, Hong, I saw you over there getting a little dangerous, getting off the rail. I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Max, uh, Maxim, I don't even know what's going on over there, but okay, all right, you're back. See you. Hey, friends. All right, so let's just move on to answering the resolutional question. How many of you have already thought about what your direct answer is to the resolutional question? Nobody? That's fair. All right. So we know that the resolutional question is, should the United States federal government enact, I'm, I'm forming it as a question, even though it's, it's a statement. And for the 2020-2021 topic, traditionally, debate topics have been formed in the form of a question. So the purpose of this activity is to give you uh, orientation to address the topic. You'll be affirmative. You'll be negative. 
but you should have an understanding of the topic that comes from your actual perspective on should this thing happen or not, right? So if we know that the question is, should the United States federal government enact substantial criminal justice reform in the United States in forensic science, policing, and sentencing, how many of you think that this is something that should happen for each of those plans? So I wanted you to just take like about, let's say it's uh, 341 for y'all right now, right? I'm on Detroit time, so I'm trying to make sure three. Okay, perfect. So let's take five minutes to think about those three planks, forensic science, policing, and sentencing. Do you think that those things need to be reformed? And I want everybody to kind of think about why, because I want us to discuss as a group, because I'll create a Google Doc with everybody's kind of thoughts to help generate some ideas for debating on this topic. Is that clear? All right, let's start with forensic science. How many votes do we have for yes, forensic science should be reformed? Three? Got one for no, <laughs> I'm assuming. All right. Let's hear some of those answers as to why. Why do we think that forensic science is a, a, a component of criminal justice system that should be reformed based off of what you know so far? A lot of the um, a lot of the like methods that they've been using are like now being proven to like not be actually true. So with one example, um, I know about like dental, they would like um, check people's teeth and like compare them to teeth marks or whatever. And all, like there are some dentists that just like pretty much made up the evidence and then somehow conclusively said that this person was indeed um, the criminal when they weren't because it wasn't like super clear or whatever. So that's just like one example of forensic science not working. So stuff like that should be performed. Awesome. What are other people's considerations? Scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um just adding on to that uh many of the like uh laboratories aren't necessarily certified and many of the like many of the scientists i'm using quotes here because they're <laughs> not really scientists and they're just like self-claimed scientists oh so many probably let's say experts many experts in forensic science are not maybe certified they're just claiming to be experts many experts else to add on to that even if they may technically be certified they may have like outdated knowledge and stuff that doesn't reflect the updated rules around forensic science Um, additionally, like in terms of like the DNA type of stuff, we leave DNA everywhere, so it's not necessarily a conclusive thing. And a lot of people are biased to, um, to the to like forensic science because like in media, yeah. Um, adding on like to what Maxim said, I think that forensic science isn't always accurate because like even if like these scientists do get results that they might not always be like they're not like the truth because they can mess things up or usually like Nariel said like they have certain biases to, to them sum that up for me so like basically their like, the results aren't accurate and I guess it also happens like behind the room where people can't really see it. Anything else we want to add on to what we know about criminal just or I'm sorry, forensic science so far? And what, what are some things about it that might make us think that it needs to be reformed? 
just a quick addition, which Ari was kind of touched on. And it's not just like media biases towards forensic science, but also like sometimes scientists have biases in, in relation to the case that can maybe affect how they interpret their data. So that's why like, you know, it's reforming. So one, like for example, by reforming it, you would just focus on the data itself and not allow in interpretation from the scientist or something like that. Yeah. I like these. So I'm going to say some takeaways for research. I would encourage, based off of what we talked about today, just for this section, I would encourage us to look into what are all the methods of evidence collection that are considered forensic science. Um, what are some other kind of things that I think will be helpful based off of what we talked about so far? How do you individual, I'm putting this together like this so that as you're working through like the topic, you'll know what kind of ways to orient your research. So these are direct questions you can put into the Google search bar. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, but you can, you can play with this however you want to. The purpose is to just kind of give you, um, a, give you some, a way to get started on some of your research. Cause I know that with the bottle tournaments, you are limited to the evidence that we have, but it doesn't mean that you can't make your own analytics. And so the breadth of knowledge that you can gain from doing some research on your own are still things that you can add into the conversation, even if they aren't in the bottle car. What are ways to improve forensic science standards? Because I heard some folks mention that um, a lot of that they are not they're not double checked, and that th we just have like a lot of complications about even some of the things that are seem like they are maybe some of the better methods of forensic science. So there's probably people in the field and outside of the field who are related to it in some way that have considered or made some suggestions about how to make it better. All right, so we got one person for why should forensic science not be reformed? Could you just give us a little bit of ideas about what made you vote for this side? Uh, it should be abolished. If it if it doesn't fall, if like, you know, if hmm. reform is if reform is different from abolishment, then instead of being reformed, it should be abolished as, you know, the previous. I like that. I actually like that a lot, Muriel. That's a really creative way to think about it. Um, it should. It should be abolished. Because? Uh, because if you rely on reform, you're still relying on the the thought that it's still like a okay practice um, or a practice that is actually beneficial to, um, you know, to, to people who are involved in the criminal justice system. So would you say that it should be abolished because all forensic science practices are inconclusive, like they're not 100% um, falsifiable. So we should make sure that that is, I think I'll put that as a question afterwards. It should be about because no methods in forensic science are truly testable slash non falsifiable.
Okay. Some other thoughts? None. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's kind of poopy. All right. Let's move on to policing. So how many people do we got for yes, policing should be reformed? Four out of four. That makes my heart warm. <laughs> makes my heart very warm. So let's get into some reasons why uh, policing might need to be reformed. Anybody can start. Go ahead. Uh, I think it should be reformed because the U.S. police only need about six months of the academy training to become a police officer, whereas in other countries, they need like years of like academy training. So like, you know, it makes them unreliable as a police officer to like use less training and not train enough to understand when something's a threat and when's not a threat mostly because they have like armed weapons like well they're armed with like lethal weapons all the time so right that's a good one to add on to that and kind of build off what she said how you know instead of like actually um learning about like the like psychological kind of workings of some situations they just rely on weapons and stuff instead and so if, if they did have that you know extra training like most other countries would or like you know people were talking about how hair salons require more training for you know to become a hair person than That's instead of a police biology. officer so it's just like really eye-opening like we prioritize speed over quality of our police officers which ends up making them far worse so I'll put it as oh, sorry yeah go for it uh, I just want to add the fact that uh, Britain or some place in England, most places in England don't use weapons at all. Like their police don't use, have carry arms, like aren't not armed, they have nothing. So like, it's just crazy that we can't do that, but they can. So like. So how would you describe it as a reason why American police should need to be reformed? If there's a way for you to disarm somebody without using a gun, then it should be the first choice, not like it shouldn't, and like it should be a, the like using of a weapon should be a last choice, not a first choice. So just not having it on them, them just relieves that, like takes away that the choice of, you know, actually killing someone, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'll explain it better. Like. <laughs> No, I think I got you. Um, make, I want to make sure that I'm what, kind of wording this kind of as you're speaking it. So other countries are using weaponry as a last choice response to situation, whereas the U.S. is using that as just a, a regular option? Yeah, kind of. Like, other countries aren't even carrying the weapon with them, like, at all. They don't carry guns or stuff like that. Um. Additionally, like police have a sort of like wolf sheep, wolf or dog protect sheep type of mindset. So like they are put on like a sort of pedestal, even though they, you know, are shown to be quite lethal. And kind of. Summarize that for me, Nuria. Um, I guess to summarize that, it's that the media portrays the police as good guys. So it's like, or uh, how do I say this? Like the police have such a, that that is really hard to explain. Um, as let's say like media perception of police as neutrally good is bad because or is, uh, what is the finished part of that uh this is bad because like the police are shown to often like rely or like because of police brutality especially it's not substantiated because of current police brutality okay. really don't know how to word stuff 
No, I was, I, we just need to work with it together. You know, I, I know how it is, you know. <laughs> um. Kind of another way of maybe forming that is, you know, like Nuriel mentioned kind of like wolves and sheep's clothing. So it kind of like gives people a false sense of security around police, which, you know, as we've seen is something that we maybe shouldn't have, or at least not now. Ideally we should, but realistically, not so much. And then another thing that I wanted to talk about was um, like reforming like the leadership of at least specific um, police precincts and groupings so like with there was one post that I saw about the New York City police t um, and some officers were t talking about how, you know, their higher ups were telling them to, you know, do certain things like racist profiling or whatever to meet certain quotas. So kind of, um, you know, changing the focuses. It's a bad word of, or a bad way of saying it, but, you know, Kind of like reforming the rule books and rhetoric of the police. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna word this correctly either, but like policing was shown to um increase crime instead of like um, like de-escalating situations. Um, I would probably like add up to that by saying that police usually like, they don't have enough training like to know when to de-escalate situations because when like recently, like when there have been protests, police usually just um, like we bring in like tear gas and stuff, like they should get a lot more training on when to like slow things down and probably like talk to Google more. Yeah. There needs to be, there is a need for innovative conflict de-escalation tactics for police. And I'm, I'll add in a caveat of that is sensitive, sensitive, sensitive to the diverse populations that they serve. We got any more? Just a short, not too important thing, but kind of similar to the previous thing about kind of like trying to, you know, bridge the disconnection between police and, you know, the people that they're supposed to serve. So kind of like, you know, making them more human to people which of course has to come after all the other reforms and whatnot, but that's like what the end goal should be, I guess, for police reform. Uh, substantial reform to police policies, including, but not limited to, to um, non violence tactical training or not, let's say non lethal, because I think that there might be time where they need to de excavate a situation that's violent to non lethal tactical training. Um, let's say some racial bias training uh, 
cultural competency training uh, etc <laughs> um, after making substantial reform to policing policies police must dismantle their perception as um let's say i'm trying to figure out how to kind of word that as people or oh, as mm, as individuals who are who are removed from the communities that who are removed from and above the communities that they serve. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Any reasons why policing might not be reformed? You say no. <laughs> well, you know, for the purposes of, of this, if, if anybody actually does feel like there's some reasons where policing might not need to be reformed, I don't want to sway you in my own beliefs. But if there's any reasons why you think that policing might not need to be reformed, speak now. Going once, going twice. So policing should be reformed. All right, sentencing. What are some reasons why sentencing might need to be reformed? I'm going through this a little bit quicker because I want to make sure that we can be able to get everybody out in a little bit of a timely manner. <laughs> um, one thing is kind of like making judges, you know, sentencing less arbitrary because there's examples of people being sentenced for the same crimes by the same judge like around the same time and they have like totally different sentences so kind of like more clearly enforcing yeah like there we go standardizing um the sentencing procedure i guess Avoid I the arbitrary sentencing by judges that are couch an individual bias um kind of on that end of the spectrum uh i know there's mandatory minimum sentencing which uh those are the guidelines that judges might have to follow i don't really remember much about this one but um uh, if it's like the three strikes you're out type of thing, then uh, not all of, like people are not always fairly judged for what, for their actions, I guess. So elimination of, of minimum sentencing, how about yeah. that? I want to add one i would say like application of maximum sentencing or standardization of maximum sentencing i typically didn't well answer like add one but that the one that nuriel suggested just made me think of that standardization of maximum sentencing what are some other thing reasons why sentencing might need to be reformed well things like the death penalty are definitely something that are that can be as inhumane um in most countries but has not been federally outlawed. There are a few states that have death penalties still in the United States, but there's still some. <laughs> yeah. 
So bail is separate from sentencing, right? It is. It is, but you have to, sometimes people can, yeah, it is. That's not important. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm about to add again. Um, just on a different one, sentencing could be increased for like companies that violate stuff. So, or, like um, large scale companies. So more, so like. Harder in, prosecution in, of corporations. Wait, what did you say? Harder prosecution of corporations. of corporations that commit federal state laws Um, Melissa, huh? Um, I would say that sentencing should be reformed in that, um, like, I guess courts shouldn't be able to sentence, like, people of color for, like, I guess, super long amounts of time, because, like, some more wealthy people or, like, are able, I mean, just get sentenced for, like, a few months while like other people who steal something get sentenced for years. I'm gonna add that on to the standardization of maximum sentencing. So let's just say that, um, I'll, I'll just make it a second sentence, but it'll kind of be still with that wing of just that um, overrepresented represented racial groups kind of summarize I, I i get what you're saying but i'm trying to put it in like the right language because i understand that you mean that people are given like ridiculous amounts of sentences and that's generally happening to racial groups which is why they're being overrepresented in prisons but how would you kind of summarize that up um, i guess like overrepresented racial groups um will get unfairly sentenced for um, for longer periods of time. Unfairly sentenced to higher um, higher are being unfairly unfairly sentenced. Um, another one to add is uh, that, um, like, quali qualified immunity and that, like, even for some police who don't necessarily, or, like, there's, it's overly specific and tends to not act. Say that again. Uh, qualified immunity should be reformed for police to have, or for, for police for like police to have less of it. So police should have less access to qualified immunity. Why? Um, because they are like, they use it to, be, to their advantage and like, because it's overly specific and police don't actually get punished for you know, biased actions. That sound good? Oh, Melissa just appeared. <laughs> um, 
Um, do we have any other things that we think that might be a part of, or Melissa, do you have anything you wanted to add? It's gonna sound kind of like dumb when I say it, but like, it's like if you do the crime, like take the time, like, or do the time. Cause like a lot of people uh, are not, I don't know if you like, I don't know how to explain it, but like, you know, like most like rape cases are like the per the offender doesn't get that much time where mm -hmm. like, but sometimes they do. It's like, it depends on like, if you've done the thing and you know it's bad, and you don't get the time that does it you should like no matter what you do what if, okay I don't know how to explain it like let's say that happens yeah so one person does it and they get time in jail like and then the next time someone else does it they don't get the same time like I feel like they should fix that for like if you know like for you to be found guilty and you not getting the same time as the other person it shouldn't it's not fair to like and it would just like, I don't know how to explain it better. <laughs> what I'm getting from this, and you let me know if this doesn't, does or does not sound like what you're trying to say. Um, standardization of sentencing based on the type of crime committed. Yeah. Yeah, sounds better than what I said. All right. No, I understand. Like, it's hard when you, as you're thinking it, to, like, make it come out of your mind in the words that you're thinking it in your mind. So, yeah. that's what we're here for. Try to make it make it make sense. Give you something to come back to. Um, do we have any, I, did, do we have any suggestions on why policing might, or, excuse me, sentencing might not need to be reformed? Uh, Don't feel sorry if you have something. Go ahead. Kind of off topic but on topic does abolition go under reform or is it something completely different because no, i don't understand because i i think that like honestly for because i know that we were having some because many of us seem like we we feel pretty committed to that all the planks of the resolution need some work and so i definitely would say that abolition is something that would be that would fall under the no it should not be reformed because a strong argument of abolition is that the criminal justice system is just screwed up <laughs> forever. And that the only way to enact any reform is to get rid of the system and begin anew. Now, one of the things that I will say that are, will probably be important in developing an argument for abolitionism is that you would have to win that there is nothing redeemable about the current system and that it is possible to wholly collapse these areas. Mm -hmm. Which I think is probably easiest with forensic science personally, but for policing and sentencing, um, I think it, it might be more of an uphill battle, but that's definitely something that should be considered. So do you wanna make an argument of why sentencing should be abolished? Yeah, because I have a lot of them. I have a lot of the abolished ones, but I didn't know if I could just like restate them for re no, it should not be reformed. But sentencing ultimately relies on institutions to, uh, or just relies on the institutions being lawful. Um, it assumes that like. Oh, can we? that it relies on individuals judge like let's say and I put in parentheses judges lawyers um, law let lawmakers and shapers etc having a um, neutrally just perspective on a, oh, wait, neutrally justice perspective, a neutrally just, I, I think that's a sentence. Sentencing, tell me if that sounds okay. Sentencing should be a policy because it relies on individuals having a neutrally just perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
also it's uh, like it fundamentally criminalizes certain people because of like over representation through or, would that be for like uh policing or wait what's the, you had to finish the statement um, kind of, say what you were saying again because it fundamentally criminalizes certain groups of people through overrepresentation within, like, or like, over. So sentencing is historically applied most um, strictly and harshly to racial groups that are currently overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Nuriel is our abolitionist. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other ideas about why the sentencing might not be reformed? And I would say that for folks, that it seems as if we're all kind of like on the side of policing and sentencing and forensic science needs some reformation. Um, if you kind of agree with that, I would encourage you actually to consider it an abolitionist stance as Nuriel has been suggesting thus far. Um, but since we're running out of time, let me actually text Jasmine because Jasmine has to stop this recording at a certain point. I want to go over in a brief assignment, very brief. <laughs> Let me tell her two minutes. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna send you all this Google, this document. Um, I'm gonna save it as a Word document and I'll send it out to all of you. I want you to look up and find three reasons that are not on this list to add to each of these areas. So three sentences that you will add to, yes, forensic science should be reformed. Three sentences to, no, forensic science should not be reformed. Three, sen three sentences like we did today on, yes, policing should be reformed. Three sentences for, no, policing should not be reformed. This is not because you will have to defend it. But this is so that you know that the arguments that exist on the topic right now. And so it won't be everything, it won't be somebody's case list, but the purpose is just get you more familiar with arguments that are surrounding the topic. And so when you create these three sentences, I want you to link it to an article that you got this, that the, you got the argument from. Does anybody not understand that assignment? Um, can you keep as a Google Doc, or at least for me, because I don't have a word. Yeah, so I'll share, I'll share it to you as, can I actually, I want you all to, I'm, I'm not sure I have everybody's email. I believe I have, I have Noriel's email. Who's in SLC? Hong, are you in SLC too? No? Okay, so I'm going to drop my email in the chat right now. And let me stop this here. Hello, are we good? Hold on. So we're finished we're for the people who need to get this document. So I have Nuriel's email. I believe I should have Melissa. You sent us an email last week, right? No? Okay, just in case. If you're not Nuriel, because I know I got an email from Nuriel, um, send me an email. Oh, I just sent that to Hong actually individually. My email is just bkimbro at Bado. But here it is. And so I will send this out. I will share this as a Google Doc for you, Max Maxim. And then for everybody else, if you could just complete this as a Word document, that would be great. All right. Everybody understand the assignment? Three arguments for each of those sections. Three for yes, three for no on forensic science, policing, and sentencing, and link it to the article that you base the argument from. Okay? Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. This is great.